Hi, welcome back. I hope that quarantine is going okay for you and that you're all safe and secure. Uh, as promised, I'm recording today's lecture for Euripides Medea because I can't teach face to face at the University of Manchester today. I don't think I'll be able to for quite some time. So marching on with the Greek tragedy module and if you're not from Manchester, then you're more than welcome to join us. Today, we're gonna to be having a look at Euripides Medea and constructing gender. Now, for people who are familiar with the play, this may be actually a really well hackneyed theme, a really popular theme, but it's something that Euripides makes so pertinent and clear throughout the tragedy. So just in summary and overview, if you've not been able to keep up with your reading because of obvious distractions that are going on right now, uh, Euripides Medea would have been a well-known myth for his audience sitting down. The premise of the myth is kind of a follow-on from the Argonautic mission. So Jason has been out with the Argonauts competing and completing in trials um, to gain his rightful throne. So he has to complete quests much like the Herculean tasks, like um, getting treasure from a dragon and dealing with fire-breathing bulls and all sorts of stuff. And it's on this journey that he meets Medea. Medea is the princess of Colchis, so again we're dealing with um, somebody from the east, somebody from what the Greeks would have perhaps known as Asia Minor, which for us is modern day Turkey. And Medea helps Jason, he is the foreign prince that's come to her land to complete a task, and she is the princess with the knowledge that's going to help him get past the dragon. Now this is really popular um, on a lot of ancient art artwork on vases and pots etc um, and it's really well known from Daniel Ogden's study on Draco and on dragons and snakes in the ancient world which is a great book have a little look at it. So Medea has helped Jason achieve his goal but in doing so she betrays her family and that is a really really important theme for women in tragedy for women who become wives the idea that you have to forsake one family in order to join and create another one. It's something that we see in monologues reasonably often as a theme, um, and it's something that's come up in fragments of other stories, which I'll talk about later if we have time. So at the outset of Euripides' play, the backstory has already happened, and whilst leaving Colchis, what Medea has done in order to avoid her father <clears throat> is she's killed her brother, Aspertus. Not only has she killed him, She's chopped his body up into pieces and thrown it into the sea. Now to us as a modern audience, this sounds like a really grisly detail, but we might remember from other tragedies um, in the fifth century how important burial is. Um, if you've ever studied Sophocles' Antigone, the crux of the whole tragedy is the right to bury somebody. And what Medea achieves by cutting her brother up is she stops the Colchians pursuing her because they have to collect the prince's body, they have to collect Absurtus's body in order to give him a proper burial. And that slows them down and enables Medea and Jason to escape. So she's committed fratricide, she's committed almost the ultimate betrayal really of her father in order to leave with Jason and she sacrificed a great deal. When she arrives in Colchis however, um, by this point they've had a detour to see Peleas' daughters. Now Peleas is in many variants the king who set these trials for Jason, he's Jason's uncle. And what Medea does is she persuades Peleas' daughters to kill him by suggesting that she can help the daughters perform a rejuvenation ritual to make their father young again. And again we see this on artwork. So the idea that Medea does this sort of demonstration, a QVC doll demonstration of look how it's done with um, an old, old sheep. She slices its throat and then drains its body, pushes potion through it in a burning bubbling cauldron and the sheep comes out as a small lamb. Um, and by doing this, she is capitalising on her reputation as a witch. It's something that started when she provided a, a potion to make the dragon sleep um, and it's followed her to the daughters of Peleas so she's told them she's got a potion to rejuvenate their father. She hasn't. She's used it as a, a deceit to make them kill Peleas, to make them slash his throat and have nothing to bring him back, nothing to rejuvenate him. By the time we're in Corinth, Medea has left Colchis. She's killed many men on the way 
in domestic settings using um, cunning and her wiles in order to get away. And she's done this for Jason. She's killed Pelias for Jason. She's killed her brother for Jason. She's given up a great deal for Jason. And we learn at the outset of Euripides' play that despite all this, Jason is now marrying a Greek bride. He's decided that in order to make a proper match, he needs to marry a Greek woman because a woman from Asia Minor is unacceptable. She is a barbarian. Uh, despite the fact that Medea and Jason share two sons. So the premise of Euripides' play is that Medea is scorned by her love rival. And then immediately we start to get a threat from Creon, the king in Corinth, that Medea and her sons will be exiled. So she's given up her family home, her birth home, and she's about to lose her marital home as well. So she's really in a dire, dire position. And as the play unfolds, we're going to see that the way Medea overcomes this is to spite Jason in the most painful way. So Medea throughout the play deliberates on if, how, why to kill their sons, the sons that they share, to break her connection with Jason. She also develops a poison mantle, so a poison robe for the princess that Jason's decided to marry in Medea's place. So that's the premise of the tragedy. She's given up a lot through crime and now she's going to have to resolve her situation through crime. And that's the expectation of Medea that the audience sits down with. So Euripides' audience would be familiar, of her back, familiar with her backstory. They would be familiar with the premise of the play. And really Euripides' job is to manipulate how they receive the characters as the drama unfolds. So today the questions that I'm putting to us as a group are how does Euripides challenge Greek gender roles in his characterization of Medea? To unravel this, we're going to have a look at the way that the chorus receive Medea. So in my Greek Tragedy Explained series, I mentioned that the chorus present a public voice and a public point of view. And in Euripides' Medea, we have the point of view of Corinthian women, proper Greek women of marital age who are married. Um, <clears throat> we also have the point of view of the Greek nurse in Medea's household. And the nurses are familiar, she knows the family very well. And we get her perspective and her point of view on Medea. A little bit like if you watched the Hippolytus video I filmed last week, we see that Phaedra has an attendant nurse with whom she has a very close relationship. Um, we're also going to have a little look at how male characters receive and react to Medea, in addition to the way Medea presents herself. So it's not just going to be about... <clears throat> Medea as Medea tells it, but we're going to examine how other characters receive her, how the chorus receives her in the overall world that Euripides is building within the tragedy itself. We're also going to have a look at to what extent is this part of her barbarism. So is, is Medea presented as a different woman because she's a barbarian from the east or is this somehow affected by her supernatural role? So a little bit more on that. I've mentioned already that Medea has um, capabilities in what the Greeks were called pharmaca, is, would have called pharmaca, is where we get, say, pharmacology from. So it's this idea of creating potions, basically, <laughs> in selves. Um, and it wouldn't have necessarily had to be something supernatural so much as it's a skill, a techne. It's where we get technique, technology from. <clears throat> but Medea's already demonstrated a skill in that. The way that the supernatural element comes in is through Medea's heritage. So her grandfather is the sun god Helios, her aunt is Circe or Kirke. And you may have already read about Medea if you've read Madeline Miller's Circe. Um, she appears as a young girl with Jason to talk to her aunt Circe about her predicament. So it's a really interesting insight into Medea actually, the way Madeline Miller tells that story. So all of these different things are going to impact the type of femininity that we might expect from Medea and the type of femininity or female identity that she presents to us in the first instance anyway. So the first point on the handout, which I've popped on Blackboard for you, if you are not at Manchester Uni and want a copy of the handout, I'll try and link a PDF below. It's essentially just passages of the translation that we're using and input from scholars with a couple of pictures. Okay, so no Greek woman... Um, and Barlow makes this really clear. Barlow is one of the scholars I've popped on your bibliography. Um, 
Interestingly, a lot of the scholarship on your bibliography that really focuses on gender is written by women in the 1980s, and that should come as no surprise. Be prepared when you're studying women in tragedy to spot that trend in scholarship, where feminism and the kind of first wave of feminism is going to really affect um, the way people write about these characters. Um, Euripides shows us in the play a woman unable to accept the fact of Jason's unfaithfulness. She is a woman, moreover, who simply refuses any longer to accept, at any rate, Greek female stereotypes, unless to use them with calculation to gain her own immediate ends. So Barlow seems to suggest that Medea as a character is able to affect Greek stereotypes and what she thinks... Um, will make her blend in and will make her fit in. And we'll see this more as we look at Medea's uh, actions later in the play. I've kept a loosely chronological structure so we can watch the story unfold as well as um, look into different themes and different receptions of the character. So we have these expectations of Medea and the prologue in Medea is delivered by the nurse. So whereas the plays that we've looked at so far on the module when we've looked at Bacchae and when we've looked at Hippolytus have a divine prologue, here we have a prologue from the nurse um, within the house. So here we get the backstory of Medea that I've mapped out for you. She steers the audience as to what variants of the myth she's following by lamenting the fact that they ever happened. So, would that the Argo had never set sail, etc, etc. For then my mistress Medea would not have sailed to the towers of Iorcus, struck to the heart with passion for Jason. She wouldn't have persuaded Peleus' daughters to kill their father. She'd not be living now in Corinth with Jason and her children. So here, actually, the nurse has sort of left out a little bit the, the fratricide of Aspertus, but she's focused on the death of Peleus' daughters in the passage that I've given you. So we know that Medea is dangerous. She seems to get a case for diminished responsibility because this idea of being struck to the heart, it's not necessarily just a turn of phrase. It's something that would be um, a symptom of Aphrodite's intervention. So the idea that the love goddess has struck Medea and she's insensible. She's not able to uh, react in, in with sound mind because she's so affected by the goddess and this is something that Jason actually accuses Medea of later in the play when Medea tries to take credit for Jason having been able to overcome the trials and get to Corinth he says no Cupris is the goddess I need to thank Cyprus so Aphrodite but we don't see evidence of Aphrodite's in intervention in the play at all um unusually although this play is much loved by us at the time, Medea came third in the Dionysia, and Euripides is unusual in that, from the evidence we have, he seems to have been the first playwright to present Medea of sound mind. So previous treatments of Medea, say Carcanus Medea, which is quite lost to us, even the fragments suggest a sort of madness, um, whereas Euripides shows us at great length Medea deliberating what she's going to do and we're going to see this idea of intelligence and cunning and foresight as we work through the passages together. So just to create a link for you, last time we looked at Hippolytus we were looking at the way that Euripides had originally written um, Euripides' Hippolytus without such a heavy divine intervention. And that had put Euripides under real scrutiny. His audiences were really unhappy about the first draft of Hippolytus and they thought that it presented Phaedra as too predatory and too hypersexualized for a um, Greek woman. And that provoked Euripides to rewrite Hippolytus. So his first go was Hippolytus Veiled and then his second was Hippolytus the Wreath Bearer. And we have a similar kind of dodgy reception of Euripides here with the Medea, where it came third and we see Medea seeming to have quite a lot of um, agency and responsibility and she is of sound mind when she is doing very controversial things and uncomfortable things. But ultimately Medea is a barbarian, so perhaps we'll start to see that different rules apply. <coughs> so the nurse goes on... Um, to talk about the strife between husband and wife because it is a domestic setting. Remember the nurse is in front of the house and Medea is inside. So at first we're gonna hear Medea crying from inside. The same way that when we perhaps looked at Hippolytus, we saw the nurse staggering out of the house with Phaedra, consoling Phaedra. So Medea came in exile to this land, but all the citizens welcome her and for Jason she's turned all to the good. 
This provides the greatest security when a wife does not oppose her husband. So the nurse here presents some expectations within the play and expectations that perhaps resounded well with Euripides' audience. Because in Greek culture, you have this expectation, or in ancient Greek culture, I should say, of a kurios. And a kurios is where we get the word curator. It's a caretaker. And this could be a woman's husband. It could be a woman's father. If she lost her father and was unmarried, it might be a brother or a cousin. But it's something that we'd refer to as the man of the house, whereby we have this person who is responsible for seeing to the runnings of the household and the behaviour of the family. So a really patriarchal structure. And this is something that the nurse sets up as expectation as an expectation for the woman. You know, when a wife does not abuse her husband, things go well, things run smoothly. So within the world of the tragedy itself and within the world of Euripides' audience, that seems to be the status quo. <clears throat> okay. Medea, however, kind of falls down as mother understatement of the century <laughs> but even from the outset of the play we see Medea um kind of what can I say we see Medea hating the role of, of being mother she hates the children she gets no joy from them I fear her fear she is planning something strange her mind is oppressed and dangerous she won't put up with abuse I know her and I fear her so straight away we start to get this expectation of a woman who won't interact with her children, of a woman who's dangerous to her children. Um, and this all seems to be provoked by Jason's betrayal. So for us as a modern audience, it's much easier to access Medea because we might see this as some sort of form of depression and we have all that kind of awareness around motherhood not always being a really happy time. But in the world of the play, it's presented as something really very sinister and unnatural, and it's part of Medea's unnatural um, characterisation. It's part of her distancing and otherness, is that she's not enjoying the role of being a mother. Um, despite the fact that actually the children have done nothing wrong. So the nurse's main fears at this stage, however, aren't that Medea will kill her children. She says, I fear her, fear she might thrust a knife through her own liver, or kill the king and the new bride and groom, and then take on an even greater misfortune. Now, the even greater misfortune is something that the audience would know. There's a level of irony here in that the audience knows something that the nurse can't really fully anticipate. So she signposted the, the version of the myth where Medea kills her children for the audience, but at this point in the play, the nurse can't even really imagine that happening, despite the fact that Medea is a very frustrated maternal figure. She's a frustrated mother. Um, for she inspires dread. If you make her your enemy, no victory song for you. But here come the children. They're finished with their game of ball. They have no thought for their mother's trouble. Young minds don't know pain. So we have the pathos of seeing these young boys run on stage, it seems, which is really unusual. It's hard to imagine how this would have been performed because of the rigorous staging rules and I can perhaps put an article up on that for you but the thing to remember is these children are silent characters so they don't necessarily if they stage the children they don't necessarily break the rules of um having a, a limited number of speaking characters on stage the other thing that we should know is in the greek original um Whenever someone would speak or sing, they would do so in a metre and they would do so in a very high register of Greek language. So it's very rare, if ever, that we'll hear extended speech from a child because it would not sound childish enough. It would sound too hyperformal um, and too unnatural. It would be very jarring and ineffective. So having the children there as silent characters works well as signposting and it's something that's worth thinking about when you're studying tragedy and doing assessments on tragedy. How would it look? How would it be presented? So we have a few things going on here then. Um, we've talked about Medea's supernatural capacities and her knowledge of pharmaca, um, and we see her as a frustrated motherhood figure, despite the fact that the children haven't done anything wrong. In a way, this kind of adds to Medea's supernatural status, because when you think of supernatural women in Greek myth, you don't think of them as mothers. So you'd be thinking of women like the Gorgon or Calypso or Kirky, people who or monsters or supernatural entities or demigoddesses who live outside of normal society. 
So they live outside of civilization, they don't live in a household, they don't live under that patriarchal structure that the nurse is expecting, they live outside the bounds of normal society and that enables them to continue in the way that they do. And we start to see Medea straining against um, the kind of patriarchal structure of her reality because the sons are part of that. And the sons are in the household, Jason is not. So in a way, they're what tethers her to the real world, to Greek expectations and values and the expectations of what she should be doing as a woman. So we see that part of it might be Medea's supernatural qualities and her strangeness, but we'll start to see how her barbarism and her um, Eastern identity creeps in later on in the play. So here in our stage directions, the tutor leads the children into the house. Um, we start to get a reaction then to the nurse. The nurse is very, very on edge about this. So the, crowd, the cloud of her grief loomed large from the start and will soon catch fire with thunderous rage. What will she do once her spirit, passionate and restless, is bitten by her troubles? And now, only now, after, after the nurse has built up all this anticipation, after she's told us what Medea's capable of, what her frame of mind is, we start to hear Medea from inside the house. And this is a device that Euripides makes repeated use of in this play. We see it later on when Medea attacks the children and we get very small snippets of dialogue from the children themselves. So inside the house, Medea fulfills a lot of the expectations the nurse has set up my suffering, my misery, the world should weep for what I've suffered. Curse you, sons of a despised mother, may you die. Your father too, may the whole household fall to ruin. So here Medea really nails the point when the sons enter the house, it's clear to the audience who know the myth what's about to happen, but the, the rationale and the reasoning for what she's doing is clear. You know, she nails the point, the whole, I want the whole household to fall down, I want the Corios uh, Jason, your father, to die. She wants to tear everything down because of the circumstances she's in. And the nurse reacts from outside. So why must your children share the blame for their father's offence? Why hate them? Children, my fear for you pains me so. A terrible thing, the temper of the mighty. So we see that Medea is completely tearing down the family structure in which she does what is expected of her. She doesn't fit this mould very well. Even under, you know, normal circumstances, she's a poisoner and a princess and she's going to really struggle in this role. Um, and because of her temper, for something Jason's done, she blames everybody. She wants to tear her own house down and transcend that kind of expected role of wife and mother. <clears throat> and it's here that the chorus of Corinthian women finally appear and we start to get a public perspective on Medea as a character. I keep hearing a voice, a cry, the unhappy woman from Colchis. Is she not calm yet? Now here the chorus really make a, a distinction between her and us. So the woman from Colchis, they know Medea, they actually, they know Medea's name. Um, they're making a point of using her homeland to s signal her out, the woman from Colchis. So we get Medea's Eastern identity um, as something that's used to distance her. Tell us, old woman, an attendant said she's been crying out loud inside the house. I feel no pleasure at the pain there since friendship binds us. So Medea, despite being Eastern, has managed to integrate fairly well into Corinthian society. But if we think back to what we heard from uh, Barlow at the beginning of the lecture, Medea is very astute at being able to use um, Greek customs and act and behave in a Greek way in order to ingratiate people and to improve her own circumstances. So it's not something that Medea truly embraces, it's something that Medea uses as a tool to improve her own situation but also to facilitate her own plan and we'll see that in the way that she uses the chorus as we move forward. Um, and finally, finally, after all of this, when the Corinthian women are outside and when there's a bit of public relations to be done, Medea actually comes out but, you know, we're at line 214 by the time Medea comes out. So we've had what dramatically works effectively as a giant drum roll for the appearance of Medea. Um, and we see that Zerba's nailed this for us really well. 
When Medea addresses the chorus of Corinthian women in the first episode, her composure and control are something of a surprise after the hysteria of the opening cries. But the key point is that her ethos becomes a problem as soon as she begins to speak on stage. For the case she proceeds to make on the basis of an experience she ostensibly shares with the chorus as women is in every sense staged. So Medea is able according to Zerba, um, not to necessarily connect with the women on a personal level through shared experience, but she's able to exploit what elements of her case or dis a distorted presentation of her case, of her problems, that she thinks will hit on the nerves of the Corinthian women listening. So we see Medea's manipulation. So women of Corinth, I've come out of the house to avoid your blame. I know many people are arrogant, some in public view, some out of sight. So she's playing on what we've seen so far, the idea of how you behave indoors and how you behave outside. And that's, like I say, that's a feature that Euripides really exploits in the play in terms of staging. And there are also those who earn from quiet ways a bad name from indifference. If people hate someone at first sight, before they know what he's like deep down, though he's done no wrong, they're not just. For a stranger, there's a special need to meld into the city. So actually, Eur <coughs> Euripides Medea makes it really clear that she's tried to integrate and she's tried to um, become part of the Greek community. And in terms of staging, it's really quite a hot debate as to what costume in Medea would have been wearing throughout the tragedy. It seems to be the case that when Medea comes out and makes her first speech, she's in Greek dress. And yet when Medea comes out on the top of the Skene roof, having committed the crime, she seems to be in barbarian dress, in Eastern dress. Um, and that's an opportunity through the staging to either fulfill or frustrate the expectations that we see in Medea's speech. Because for stage directions, uh, look to the dialogue plenty of people make the case that here um, Medea would be wearing Greek costume because she says there's a special need for me to melt into the city. So Medea is a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, she seems to be an Eastern, uh, <laughs> an Eastern witch in a Greek woman's guise. And here, although the chorus of distancer, you know, the woman from Colchis, Medea starts to speak um, as a collective so she says you know we women we suffer most and although they have their differences in terms of ethnicity or race um Medea really harps on shared experience as Zerba argues she does this in a manipulative way some people might read this as very sincere in the first place we must for a vast sum buy a husband what's worse with him our bodies get a master now Zerba points out that actually Medea never bought a husband because no traditional dowry was ever paid for Medea However, you could argue that Medea does buy a husband by killing her own brother, by betraying her own family. So the vast sum needn't be monetary. It could be in the things that she sacrificed to marry Jason that I outlined right at the beginning of today. And here's what's most at stake. Did we get a man who's good or bad? For women have no seemly escape. We can't deny our husbands. We've come to a household with new habits, new rules, and must divine how best to manage our bedmates, using skills we never learned at home. Nudge wink. So it seems here that it's a common complaint, actually, the idea that you've been dislocated into a new environment. Um, and that's something that's perhaps more sharply clear in Medea because Medea's from the East, but it's really a common complaint. And Medea carries on in this vein, really. So she says, if we do it right, our husband lives with us and doesn't fight the yoke, then life is enviable. If we don't, it's better to die. So actually, Medea really reiterates the point that the nurse made earlier on, the idea that if a woman's in concord with her husband, things run smoothly, everything's fine, and things run really well. But she then emphasises what's at risk if this doesn't happen. So... She acknowledges that what she's going through with Jason is, is an extreme case of a common complaint because it is so risky to have to go and integrate yourself into another household with another chorios, with another caretaker. You've gone from your father to your husband. Um, <clears throat> so whereas men can go out to disquiet the heart, 
women are stuck inside so we have only one person to look to so again she's <laughs> In a way, she's given a false impression because she's talking to the women, right? So she's disproving this as she says it. Um, but she says, we have only one person to look to and they say of us that we're never at risk. So this idea that because women don't fight in battle, because women don't have to go to war, they're not at risk. But Medea makes the case that if you're stuck indoors with just one person, you are at the mercy of that person. Sheltered at home while they fight with spears, how wrong they are. I'd rather three times over stand behind a shield than give birth once. Now, this is one of the most famous lines of the tragedy where Medea starts to regender herself as a man. And again, it's through the idea of frustrated motherhood. So the pain of giving birth, but also I suppose what comes afterwards. Um, Medea doesn't embrace motherhood at all. Um, and she would rather fulfil the role of a man than the traditional role of a, a woman. As she sees it, that is less risky and more appealing and better suited to her character. So that is one of the most famous lines of the whole tragedy when we're thinking about gender and gender roles. In many ways, it's expressed, expressed through parental roles or maternal roles for obvious reasons, because she's about to reject her role as a mother, reject her role as a wife, reject her connection with Jason. Um, so this is one of the ways that Medea unsexes herself, if that's what you want to uh, describe it as, in a kind of Lady Macbeth sort of fashion. <clears throat> and here's where Medea draws a sharp distinction between herself and the chorus. So, so far she's been saying we, our experience, our husbands. Here Medea makes clear that it's even worse for her as an outsider, as somebody from Colchis. The story's not the same though for you and me. You have this city in your father's houses, the joy of life and company of friends. I'm on my own. I have no city. My husband abuses me. I was brought as beauty from far away and have no mother, no brother, no kin to give me shelter from this storm of trouble. Brother is an interesting one to bring up because, as we know, she killed her brother. She chopped her brother up in order to slow her father down. Um, so you could read this as a reminder for the audience of what Medea's done and what Medea's given up, actually, to be with Jason. But she's making the case that she is alienated. In her own home, she's alienated. Um, I mean, we have Medea in the house on her own at the outset of the play. She's stuck indoors. She doesn't initially have the freedom to come out and address the audience. And this is what's perhaps unusual. We might expect Medea to come and deliver a prologue. We might expect Aphrodite even to come and deliver a prologue that absolves um, Medea of guilt, that talks about the way she made Medea feel for Jason. But here in Medea's own household, it's the nurse who comes out. It's the nurse who talks to the tutor um, about the boys when the boys run into the house. So we have this environment where Medea is discussed around her own household and she is stuck inside. She is very isolated, but very clearly isolated as far as the audience understand it. So her barbarism does become part of, um, or does affect the gender expectations we have of Medea. Her barbarism, not in and of itself, but the fact that she's moved from the east to the west and the fact that she's got that great disconnect with her home makes Medea's situation more dire. The reminder that she's uh, forfeited her role in her paternal home and she has nowhere to go prepares us for the, the extremity of what she's about to do. Um, so in lots of ways, it's the tension of traditional gender roles that affect Medea so much. The fact that she's not ready to be a mother, she doesn't enjoy being a mother, the fact that she's had bad luck in her husband, it's not necessarily um, outside of expectations, but it's in direct tension with them, I suppose. If we also look at the way that other characters react to Medea and we start to think about the way that Medea is viewed from a male perspective, we get another layer of meaning here. So, so far we've looked at the nurse, we had a little think about the chorus, we've had a look at the dialogue or the monologue of Medea herself. But if we start to look at the men in the tragedy, we get different expectations or a different perspective, I suppose, again, on the way that Medea is gendered. 
One of the reasons that Creon, for example, fears Medea is because she is a clever woman. And this brings us to point four on your handout. So for context, remember Creon is the father of Jason's new bride, Glauca. Um, Creon is trying to safeguard his daughter. Creon is the Greek Chorios that we were talking about before. He is the father, he is the caretaker looking after his daughter. We never meet Glauca on stage. We only hear about her. In many respects, Jason's new wife is instrumental. And this does a couple of things. I mean, really what we see in Euripides Medea is that the woman who toes the line, the woman who behaves, is Glauca. She has her father speak for her. She never confronts Medea. She seems very passive and very quiet. She's fearful. She's very clearly presented as the prey. And she's way less interested than Medea. Euripides doesn't do very much to curry favour or to create sympathy for Glauca. We know that her death is grisly, but she's not very well developed as a character and we don't meet her. And so we view gender through Medea and through the chorus. Medea's rival isn't presented to us in the same way. So really the chorus serves as a frame for Medea. There's no antagonist, there's no... Um, there's no kind of adversary for Medea in that way. Instead, we hear about this through Creon and we hear about this through the Chorios as well we should, because remember the expectations are, you defer to the male caretaker. But Creon is nonetheless afraid of Medea because she is too clever for her own good, because she has a reputation, because he has an awareness of the stories that Euripides' audience know about already. I fear you, no need to disguise my reasons. I fear you might do my child fatal harm. Glauca. I fear uh, you might do my child fatal harm. And there are many indications I am right. You were born clever, you have dangerous skills. So, um, skills, again, techne, we might be thinking of the pharmaca. Um, but also the deception, you know, the way that she deceives Peleus' daughters into killing their own father. This idea of being clever, so perhaps Metis we have here. But Creon completely, he seems to misunderstand the premise of Medea's pain. Uh, the loss of your marriage bed gives you pain. So for, for Creon, he cites the bed and... This is sometimes just used as a periphrastic for marriage. It's just a way to discuss marriage. But the fact that he mentions the bed specifically suggests that Creon is kind of mansplaining Medea's own pain to her. He doesn't really understand what it means for her to be where she is without any family. She's not just use, losing her um, sexual romantic relationship with Jason. She's losing the father of her children, she's losing her position in a household, she's losing her legitimacy in the community, um, she's becoming socially isolated because she's been put in the position of a woman alone, of a single parent, um, and for those reasons she's starting to reject the role of motherhood. So she's her world is crumbling, it's not just about Jason, it's about what being married to Jason means in that context and that patriarchal structure that Creon doesn't really seem to hit on. He thinks it's much pettier than that. I hear you're making threats. They tell me you say you'll act against me and the groom and bride I gave away. So before we suffer, I'll my, mount my defence. I'm better off, woman, if I incur your hatred now rather than being soft and later lament. Creon's always a bit of a pain in the arse, to be honest. Um, and here he <coughs> explicitly addresses Medea as woman, almost as if it's offensive, almost to diminish her. Um, but it seems to be part of the way that he rejects her feelings about what's happening and belittles her reaction. So he's frightened of her, but he doesn't necessarily see things from her point of view or try and win her around in any meaningful way. Um, it sets up that fear of clever women, women who aren't in their place, so to speak, women who run on emotion. He seems to think this is based on lust. Um, and that's what's frightening about Medea. She's the skillful one, she's the manipulator. And really it should be embarrassing for Creon to admit because these are things that Medea's gonna remind Jason of down the line. I'm the one that helped you succeed. I'm the reason you overcame those trials. 
and everything that made Medea an asset before, everything that was positive and got her to where she is, is now used against her and is now a reason to see Medea as a threat. So this idea of being smart, cunning, clever is something that is only really appropriate for a man. I mean, if we think about, say, Odysseus, Polytropos, Polytropos, wily Odysseus, clever Odysseus, these things are celebrated in male characters, in female characters they become dangerous because they start to press against that structure of being told what to do and behaving as you should behave, okay? No one likes a clever woman. <clears throat> so... Jason then compounds this a few lines later, or a few couple of hundred lines later, when he starts to again school Medea on how she should be behaving. So Jason tries to warn Medea against threatening the princess, against threatening Glauca, because it jeopardizes her position in Corinth and her position in that community. Jason says the way you are speaking makes you a threat. That means that you may be asked to leave Corinth. Um, and it's quite stupid of you to be putting yourself in that position, just behave. So in the first place, you live now in Greece and not your savage homeland. So Jason seems to um, try to give her etiquette lessons in how to be Greek. So we said at the outset of today, we were gonna think about how Medea's barbarism, how her Eastern identity contributes to her gender roles. Well, the fact that she's rebellious is often chalked up to the fact that she's not Greek. So the fact that she doesn't do what men tell her to do is seen as a as a kind of um, a symptom of her Eastern origins. And to an extent, that's fulfilled by the fact that she runs away from her father and kills her brother. Now, that suits Jason when it suits Jason. <laughs> but she is what she is. If you're dealing with a woman who's run away from her father, her previous Corios, to marry you, her new Corios, Expecting her to do what she's told is, in my opinion, quite frankly, stupid. Uh, she also kills her brother. So, yes, to, to that extent, in so much as Medea is rebellious against male authority, that could be seen as um, a symptom of her easternness. It's something that, that is perhaps particular to Medea. And it's something that's not... Um, an issue for the chorus, you know, the chorus suffer and struggle in their marriages, as Medea makes clear in her speech, but they don't really rebel against them in any way. Um, so in so much as Medea is rebellious, she is Eastern and that affects the way we see her gender, the way we see her, her womanhood. Um, in so much as she's supernatural, we've seen the frustrated motherhood uh, theme coming through and we've thought about other supernatural characters that we see in Greek uh, mythology as well. Okay. So Jason also argues that Medea is not stupid. So you know justice and the rule of law that doesn't brook the use of force. All Greeks know of your skill, you're famous. If you were living at the ends of the earth, no one would have heard of you. So this is Jason attempting that I made you what you are. You are only famous because you are in Greece. You are lucky to be here and you're not stupid. So do as you're told, essentially. So the idea of Medea as a clever woman makes her a threat, but it also gives her a greater deal of accountability, as Jason has it. You have more capacity to listen to instruction and behave as a woman should. No one should know how important this is, as you do, because you're clever, you're not stupid, what are you doing? So Medea's intelligence at once makes her a threat. It's unfeminine because it makes her less deferential. But at the same time, Jason knows her, he knows she's clever and he tries to twist that and suggest that it's a reason for her to behave as a Greek woman should. Okay. The tide turns a little bit. We meet one male character in the tragedy who's actually very positive about Medea. And this is Aegeus from Athens. Now, Aegeus is important. He comes in at 674, roughly, and he gives Medea her out. So one of the weirdest things about Euripides Medea is that despite the horrible crimes she commits, she never seems to be punished. Medea gets away and she flees to Athens. So although she is an Eastern princess who pushes against lots of Greek values in the play, she seeks safety in Athens. 
Remember, Athena is the civilizing force of justice that we saw in the Oresteia. So Athens is viewed in that way. Um, so it's an unusual place for Medea to seek sanctuary, really. But she's able to because Aegeus himself is in a predicament and he knows that Medea is very capable. So Aegeus is childless um, and he's gone to consult the oracle um, of Apollo in order to consider what he should do about trying to have sons and heirs. And Medea asks Aegeus at this point, what did Phoebus say then about children? And he says, words wiser than man's understanding. And Medea retorts, is it right for me to know the god's oracle? And he says, indeed, yes, since it requires a clever mind. So depending on how you want to read this, in the translation, it leaves it possible that a man could never understand the prophecy, but Medea, a woman, can. So wiser than man's understanding. But yes, yeah, you, you, I'll tell you because you have a clever mind, you'll understand what it means. And this is what enables Medea to broker um, a refuge when she's done what she's done. She says, I'll come, I'll help you have children. Um, she's promising this perhaps based on her skills and her, um, her kind of knowledge of pharmaca. People have high expectations of her. And although she's a frustrated motherhood figure in the tragedy, she offers to help someone have children as her way out. So she is capable of goodness, I suppose, whether we, we see this as being um, fulfilled or not, I don't know. But it's a bizarre twist of events because this stops us viewing Medea as the antithesis to everything that the audience holds dear. She's killing her own children because Jason has broken oaths to her and that's something we'll consider in more detail in the future. And yet she's willing to help some men, to help Jaius, have children of his own if she can go and stay in Athens in her exile. So when Medea leaves the tragedy at the very end, the audience sitting in Athens at the Dionysia imagine Medea coming to their city to seek refuge from Jason. So Euripides has not only provided opportunities for the audience to sympathise with Medea, but he puts it to them that Medea isn't going to be punished for killing her children and she's going to come to their home city, their hometown, to, uh, to seek sanctuary which is very unusual. But here we have Aegea seeing Medea's intelligence as something positive and life-bringing, and that doesn't necessarily undermine her femininity for him. So <clears throat> just thinking about Medea's cleverness as a feature of an improper woman is frustrated by the character Aegeus. Okay. What takes a turn, and this brings us back to the point that Zerba made earlier, is that because Medea hears that she's being perceived in this way, she has to react and do a little bit of damage control. And we thought about this when we looked at her address to the chorus of Corinthian women. How genuine is Medea really being at that point? We see Medea make an achingly um, ironic speech to Jason, having heard all of the, the kind of fear-mongering of you're a clever woman and we might have to exile you because that's too problematic. So here Medea addresses Jason and she absolutely turns on a dime and Jason laps it up. So she says, I praise you. All you've done for us seems prudent now while I have been a fool. So good of you it was, Jason, to go and marry another woman because she's Greek and I'm not, even though you knew I wasn't Greek when you married me. Good one good one so it's really uncomfortably ironic the fact that jason is willing to believe this i would argue makes him a, either a less likable character or makes him appear as a less intellectually shrewd or astute character i mean he knows how clever medea is and all of a sudden she's done a complete u-turn over the thing that's been making her physically ill and trapped inside the house screaming so she carries on I should be part of the planning. I should help to make it happen. Be there by the bed. Rejoice in my connection with your bride. It seems like an argument ad absurdum, like, you know, oh, I'm being so ridiculous. I should, you know, 
wait by your wedding bed and knock up the wedding dress and why not being more supportive why not i be made of honor you know she she's making it seem ridiculous and making it seem painful um and yet jason laps this up so, so she's gone so far in the other direction that it seems to be really clear to the audience how absurd Jason's expectations are. And it also makes Jason seem a less sympathetic or a le yeah, a less sympathetic character because what an idiot. Why would he believe her? And we know we've had all this build up so far of her being a clever woman. Um, and this is where Medea starts to um, play on what she's seen as male expectations of women. So she is able, because she's um, under, in a way perversely underestimated, because although men have told her she's clever and that scares them, they've also told her how she should behave. And now she pretends to fall in line with other women. She says, oh, all this rebelliousness is typically female, actually, isn't it? Because we are who we are, we women. I won't say that's a bad thing, but you must not be like us. You must not answer our silliness with your own God. So Medea kind of uses um, these stereotypes of rebellious women, silly women, emotional women. And this is something that we saw in Creon's speech. Remember, he thinks that Medea's upset because she's losing a marriage bed. So she's able to capitalize on that by um, allowing them to underestimate her actually. So having heard that she's clever and that she's a threat, we see that Medea is clever enough to play dumb and to harp on male expectations to a ridiculous degree. So um, she actually now characterizes everything that's gone before as her being um, rash, emotional, hysterical and female and oh whoops, silly me and Jason laps it up. So we see what other characters expect of Medea as a woman, but we also see how Medea reflects that, takes it and turns it around and uses it to manipulate. We've seen in a way her manipulation of the chorus. We have a tough time, you and me, we have a difficult time. It's even worse for me, but we have a difficult time, don't we, us girls? And she does the same thing with Jason. Oh, you know, aren't I, oh, aren't I a silly woman, silly me? So she's able to really pull on people's expectations and turn them around, which is what makes her so interesting and compelling as a, as a tragic character. It's also what makes her so frightening to see because she's not influenced by external factors. Medea's not influenced by the chorus. She's not influenced by the other characters. She influences them. She takes what they put to her and turns it around and completely puppet masters them. Okay. <clears throat> so Medea, having played dumb, having ratcheted this up and spoken to Jason about how silly she is, puts the start of her plan into motion. So as Zerba says, when Medea behaves like a woman, she uses it as a tool, as a device to manipulate. And here, Medea asks Jason to think of the children, which for an audience knowing exactly what Medea is gonna do is alarming. You know, it's really on the knuckle for an audience who knows what she's gonna do later on, who knows the myth. So at least tell your wife to make an appeal to her father, not to exile the children. So here Medea puts the ball back in Glauca's court. She knows Glauca's a good girl and that Glauca should, as a proper Greek woman, have respect for Jason's children. She makes this an issue of Glauca's quality and puts Glauca under the spotlight rather than herself. So rather than saying to Jason, these are my children, these are our children, we've had them, you lobby for them to stay, on principle, Medea moves the scrutiny and the spotlight from her to Glauca by saying, Glauca's a good woman, surely she'll care about the kids enough. So she's able to manipulate this um, and take the scrutiny off of herself a little bit more. And Jason reflects this, he knows Glauca's a good girl. He says, oh certainly, I expect her I will persuade. You know, Glauca's very suggestible, Glauca cares about children, Glauca's a good girl, she'll do what her husband asks. Oh, I'm sure you will, Medea says, if she's like other women. So a nice little jellyfish thing. If she's a real woman, if she's a proper woman, if she's a well-behaved woman, she'll let my children stay. 
And this is how Medea secures her plan to send the children with the poison mantle to Glauca. Because if Glauca had refused, that would have been a reflection on Glauca, not Medea. It's a masterstroke in playing on gender expectations. Um, and Medea says, I'll contribute my efforts as well. I'll send some gifts to her, ones I'm sure are thought most beautiful by far in all the world, and the children will carry them. So by presenting this as a resolution, Medea is able to send secret weapons via her children. She uses her children to deploy revenge, but also she she implements them in, in the crime by having them deliver it. So she secures their fate. She can't really let them be exiled. She can't assume that they're going to be exiled once they've done this. So here, even Medea's role as a mother is only really used to facilitate the revenge that she's seeking throughout the play. Okay. And this brings us to Durham. So here on your handout, certainly the femaleness of the legendary Medea stands unquestioned, as does the misogynist flavour of this male authored fable. Again, this is written in 1984, so I expect quite heavy handed language. Medea herself, of course, hates men curious absence in western languages of a convenient adjective she is in fact homicidal in the gendered particular sense of the term in an inversion of the comforting and comfortable myth of isis as female gatherer and weaver a savior of the male osiris medea dismembers and scatters in the first place not only defined as killer of men, Medea also incarnates the destruction of private, domestic, traditionally female world of family. So Medea exploits an opportunity for a blended family to kill her love rival. Um, she uses her sons as weapons to kill her love rival. And she puts this, her, her ability to do this is secured by the fact she knows her love rival is a well-behaved woman. So she plays on gender roles because everybody behaves how they're expected to, apart from Medea. And that's how Medea is able to triumph. So when we come to the murder itself and bring this all together, how does this culminate at the climax of the play? So what Medea has done is ensured that the chorus heard her plan for Glauca and didn't say anything. She's made them complicit. Um, so she's implemented she's implemented her children she's implemented the chorus um, she's made Glauca make the decision to accept the gifts she, she, she's playing on how she expects everybody to behave to drag everybody into this mess with her and this is when the chorus describe Medea as wretched woman wretched woman so straight away the way that Creon speaks addresses her as a woman as a way of belittling her here the chorus distance her as a female figure, wretched woman, almost as though she's, she's disgraced the role of woman itself by killing her own children. Then you are made from iron or rock, since the children you bore you'll kill, their fate in your hands. And so again, this idea, this emphasis on childbirth and the visceral nature of childbirth. And remember how risky and painful it was to give birth in the ancient world, to kill the children you bore does it just doesn't I mean it doesn't bear thinking about in any cultural context but the pain and the risk of childbirth makes the children all the more precious in a way and we see this in other myths where women gloat about having loads of children um or where we see mothers who struggle to have children for example I'm thinking particularly of Niobe who had many children and bragged about it and was struck down by Juno or Hera in response um so here the chorus, one woman I know of, one of all before, who struck her beloved children with her own hand. I know, maddened by the gods, the wife of Zeus sent her wandering from her home. Wretched she falls into the sea at their impious death, her foot stepping beyond the edge into the sea. She dies as she destroys her own two children. What horrible thing now couldn't become to be? A women's bed of sorrows, how great the harm you've done to mankind. So here we have an internal myth of Ainu <clears throat> that she used to compare her to Medea. I remember here the chorus are outside the house as Medea is attacking the children. 
So the chorus relate out to tell us about these frustrated mother figures in other myths and to make that parallel with Medea. It also provides the opportunity for Jason to rush in. So here, everybody is referring to people as woman. Woman, it's a, it's a key address in this scene. You, women, who've been standing by the house. So the chorus have reacted to the cries of Medea's sons within the house, but they haven't gone in to intervene. The chorus don't enter the scheme, eh? But also they seem to be frightened too. Um, you, women, who've been standing by the house. Is Medea a woman who's done dreadful things inside? Or has she fled? Is she gone? At this point, Jason is talking about the death of Glauca, the poison mantle. He, he doesn't know yet what she's done to the sons. But again, you women, a woman. So the heinousness of the crime being linked to the gender comes across in the language. And here we have the final scene. So we get this image of Medea on a serpent chariot donated to her by her grandfather, Helios. Um, and she's presumably at this point on the top of the skein eh, just out of reach. Um, the dialogue suggests that the bodies of her sons are on the roof of the skein eh, with her because they seem to be out of Jason's reach. So not necessarily an echiclema scene because no one seems to pull the boys out. The boys seem to be on the chariot with Medea because again, as with Aspertus' body, that prevents Jason from being able to bury the sons appropriately. So she not only kills his children, she denies improper burial rights as well. And here we see this key exchange with Jason and Medea where we see Medea's gender is called into question again. Hateful thing, woman, the greatest enemy to the gods and the whole human race. So it's not clear because he says woman, whether he's talking about her in particular or women in general. So um, we've seen this also with the chorus just before. A women's bed of sorrows, how great the harm you've done to mankind. So this idea of womankind being a kind of what can I say, a blight on humanity, a stain on humanity, because when women misbehave, they control things like the legitimacy of children, um, and they are able to dismantle the household if they don't behave how they should behave. You dared, you who bore them, to thrust the sword into the children. So again, you who bore them, that emphasis on childbirth, so they are your own children. This isn't a wicked stepmother narrative. These are your children. And there are plenty of wicked stepmothers in Greek mythology. Um, made me childless, ruined me. So again, rather than lamenting for the children in and of themselves, it's what the children represent and what the children mean to Jason. Remember, these are two boys. These are Jason's sons and heirs. <laughs> And Medea hasn't just killed their children. She's secured Jason's childlessness for the foreseeable future by killing Glauca as well. So Jason doesn't have a viable alternative woman with whom to have children. His bloodline is done for now. Okay. And this is where Jason makes the really key point, another really famous quote from Euripides Medea. There isn't a woman in Greece, no Greek woman, who would have dared this. So no Greek woman would have killed her children the way who you have killed your children. And even in the story of Aino that we get beforehand, she plunges into the sea with her children. She doesn't sacrifice them. I mean, in some of the artwork as well, the death of Medea's children is imagined on an altar. We can't say that this is um, reflecting Euripides, but in the reflections of the myth, Medea's murder of the children is presented as sacrificial. They're at an altar, they're killed with a knife. Um, yet I thought you worthy of marriage instead of one of them. A marriage of ruin and hate, not to a woman, no, to a lion more savage than Tyrrhenian Scylla. We have a few kind of layers of things we've already discussed today that I think come together really neatly in Jason's final rebuke to Medea. So, number one, Medea's barbarian origins affecting the way that she's sort of gendered, affecting the way that we perceive Medea's womanhood. So there isn't a woman in Greece, no Greek woman. Jason makes it really clear that Medea's barbarian origins um, differentiate her from the Greek women he knows. He gets a bit close to the knuckle when he says, I thought you worthy of marriage instead of one of them. That's not 
100% true Jason you have buggered off and married a Greek woman and that's more or less the problem so again Euripides makes Jason perhaps quite hard to sympathize with um, and then the supernatural nature of Medea if we imagine Medea at this point is stored on the roof of Eskine she is in the position of what we may have called in the past a deus ex machina now often we would imagine the machine the kind of crane um, contraption to lift a god if they appear ex machina at the end of a tragedy. Medea seems to be on top of the skene because she has the children with her so couldn't be lifted but she's still in a supernatural position up on the chariot. So Medea's supernatural elements are made really clear and Jason underlines this as well by comparing her to the skiller so to a monster um, the lion imagery is something that we've been looking at in other seminars on the Manchester module that we're doing together. Um, when we've looked at Clytemnestra being described as a lion, and this is something that really permeates the Oresteia. Um, something that's really associated with the crime, but isn't necessarily all that gender specific. It's more as a mark of dehumanising um, the murderer in that particular tragedy. Okay, so final thoughts, let's draw all this together um, and direct your reading a little bit for the module. So <clears throat> we asked the questions at the start of today's lecture. How does Euripides challenge Greek gender roles in his characterisation of Medea? Well, Euripides really presents expectations by setting them up in the chorus's speech and also in the nurse's speech. It's clear from both that... Um, a woman should defer to her chorios, the man of the household, um, and that a woman who doesn't do this is threatening. So he sets up expectations through the characters around Medea. To what extent is this part of her barbarism on the one hand and her supernatural role on the other? Well, we've seen Medea be differentiated as woman of Colchis. We've seen Jason make it really clear that no Greek woman would have dared what she has done. And Medea's rebelliousness, the fact that she's in Corinth, having come from Colchis, seems symptomatic of the fact that she's from the East. She doesn't defer to her male chorioi, she doesn't defer to her father and her brother when she leaves Colchis. The difference is, at the time, that really suits Jason, and now it doesn't suit him, because he's the chorios himself. We've also seen the supernatural role of Medea... Uh, come through in perhaps her frustrated motherhood so that's something that's really symptomatic of witches um, or demigods in Greek mythology so we're thinking of Circe, Calypso uh, and similar and of course we know that Circe is Medea's aunt so this idea of a woman who usually lives outside of society who doesn't fit the constraints of a household of an oikos is particular to supernatural characters as well so we have these overlapping ideas but what's also come out of today that I think is in a way more interesting is the way that Medea has an awareness of what other people's expectations of her are, what other people expect of her as a woman. She does a fab job of really manipulating the chorus and playing on all of their expectations. She does a painful job of manipulating Jason and that allows her to fulfill her plan. And it's so absurd as a viewer, you could say you almost want her to fulfil her plan because how could anyone expect her to conform to those circumstances? So Medea's cleverness is something that we've not just seen in the way that other characters fear her, but in the way that she's able to harness their expectations and use them against them. And in the context of Euripidean tragedy, that's what makes her such a frightening but fascinating figure. We talked at the beginning about how controversial the Hippolytus tragedies were because initially... Uh, Phaedra was a very sound mind and wasn't struck by any external forces and for me that's what's best about Medea she's not affected she affects everybody around her and that was what makes her such a frightening female figure in Greek tragedy okay well I hope that that was helpful um, and that it at least gave some structure to your day in really uncertain times. I hope you're doing okay at studying at home, and if you want anything, do let me know. There should be more content to come, because what else? Okay, stay safe, hope you're well. Bye!